Hello there, old and new friends. Welcome to Divine Musing, episode 33, Lift Up Your Eyes. I am Destiny Rambo Corey, and I am so thankful that you have joined me for this journey into scripture, literature, poetry, and prayer as we view them through the light of transformation and growth. Here's something I've been thinking about lately. We begin with a quote from Walden by Henry David Thoreau. We must learn to reawaken and keep ourselves awake, not by mechanical aids, but by an infinite expectation of the dawn, which does not forsake us even in our soundest sleep. I know of no more encouraging fact than the unquestionable ability of man to elevate his life by a conscious endeavor. It is something to be able to paint a particular picture or to carve a statue and so to make a few objects beautiful. But it is far more glorious to carve and paint the very atmosphere and medium through which we look, which morally we can do. To affect the quality of the day, that is the highest of arts. When I was little, my father used to preach a sermon that is the foundation for today's musing. When you hear things when you're in those formative years, they have the ability to stick with you through the entire extent of your life. Though at the time you might not fully understand them, the awakening to those truths comes with maturity and with time. The message was about perspective and our ability to receive all that Christ has made available to us. If only we can awaken to the reality of how to access it. In Philippians 4, starting at verse 18, it says, But I have received everything in full and more. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent me. They are the fragrant aroma of an offering, an acceptable sacrifice, which God welcomes and in which he delights. And my God will liberally supply, fill until full your every need, according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Greek word translated as riches here means riches, wealth, abundance of external possessions, fullness, abundance, plenitude, a good that with which one is enriched. The word translated as glory here is the same word that's used at the end of the Lord's Prayer when it says, Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. One of its many definitions is, A thing belonging to Christ, the kingly majesty of the Messiah, the absolutely perfect inward or personal excellency of Christ, the majesty, that condition with God the Father in heaven to which Christ was raised after he had achieved his work on earth. Colossians 1.25 says, In this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship which God entrusted to me for your sake, so that I might make the word of God fully known among you. That is, the mystery which was hidden from angels and mankind for ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints, God's people. God in his eternal plan chose to make known to all how great are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in and among you, the hope and guarantee of realizing the glory. We proclaim him, warning and instructing everyone in all wisdom, that is, with comprehensive insight into the word and purposes of God, so that we may present every person complete in Christ, mature, fully trained, and perfect in him, the anointed. What Paul is trying to tell us here is that the riches of the glory are infinite because Jesus, our Messiah, is limitless. There is nothing we could ever need that is not waiting for us in the glory. There is nothing we could ever reach for that isn't waiting for us in Jesus. 
Even though the supplies and gifts Paul was sent as provision came through the hands of a man, he was teaching us that our provision comes from God. We have unrestricted access to the glory in the same way that Jesus did on earth, if only we knew how to access it. In John chapter 11, we see a perfect example of Jesus showing us what it means to reach into the supernatural realm, the glory, and pull what we need into existence in the natural realm. We begin reading in verse 1. Now a certain man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village where Mary and her sister Martha lived. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him, saying, Lord, he, our brother and your friend whom you love, is sick. When Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness will not end in death, but on the contrary, it is for the glory and honor of God so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved and was concerned about Martha and her sister and Lazarus and considered them dear friends. So even when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed in the same place for two more days. Then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, teacher, the Jews were only recently going to stone you, and you are thinking of going back there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of light in the day? Anyone who walks in the daytime does not stumble, because he sees by the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because there is no light in him. He said this, and after that said, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him. The disciples answered, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. However, Jesus had spoken of his death but they thought he was referring to natural sleep. So then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, who is called Didymus the twin said to his fellow disciples, let us go too, that we may die with him. So when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to see Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning the loss of their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, while Mary remained sitting in the house. Then Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give it to you. Jesus told her, your brother will rise from the dead. Martha replied, I know that he will rise from the dead in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in, adheres to, trusts in, relies on me as savior will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me as savior will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I have believed and continue to believe that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed, the Son of God, he who was destined and promised to come into the world, and it is for you that the world has waited. After she had said this, she left and called her sister Mary, privately whispering to her, The teacher is here and is asking for you. And when she heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. So when the Jews who were with her in the house comforting her saw how quickly Mary got up and left, they followed her, assuming that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came to the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her sobbing and the Jews who had come with her also sobbing, he was deeply moved in spirit to the point of anger at the sorrow caused by death and was troubled and said, where have you laid him? They said, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, see how he loved him as a close friend. But some of them said, Could not this man who opened the blind man's eyes have kept this man from dying? 
So Jesus again, deeply moved to the point of anger, approached the tomb. It was a cave and a boulder was lying against it to cover the entrance. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an offensive odor, for he has been dead for four days. It is hopeless. Jesus said to her, Did I not say that if you believe in me, you will see the glory of God, the expression of his excellence? So they took away the stone, and Jesus raised his eyes toward heaven and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me and listen to me, but I have said this because of the people standing around so that they may believe that you have sent me and that you have made me your representative. When he had said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Out came the man who had been dead, his hands and feet wrapped tightly in burial cloths, linen strips, and with a burial cloth wrapped around his face. Jesus said to them, Unwrap him and release him. So then many of the Jews who had come to be with Mary and who were eyewitnesses to what Jesus had done believed in him. I first have to point out the sarcasm of Jesus in this moment. He has just wept because the people around him clearly don't understand what's going on or who he is yet. I can't even imagine how frustrating that must have been for him. Like, Come on, people. Are you not convinced yet? Are you not paying attention? (sighs) So when he lifts up his eyes to talk to his father, he speaks aloud in a way that makes me love him even more. He begins to communicate aloud what I'm sure is his regular inner dialogue with his father and says, I know you always hear me, but because of these people standing around, I've got to say this out loud so they might believe. Like... (laughs) So much sarcasm. I love it so much. To me, the most important part of this story, though, leading up to the resurrection of Lazarus, are those four words. Jesus raised his eyes. The scripture is always so fascinating and rich. We can't just read it on the surface. Otherwise, we will miss the context and depth that's hidden inside of these tiny, vaguely translated words like raised. The Greek word used here is raised has several meanings, but the one that stands out to me in this context is to raise up, elevate, lift up, to take off or away what is attached to anything. The context that this particular word is most used in is akin to raising an anchor, to pull up what is holding you down, to elevate what was once on the ground. When Jesus raised his eyes to call Lazarus back into his body, he detached from his human physical body and sight and elevated himself into the spirit realm above the glory, saw Lazarus there and called him back. I believe this is the same thing he did every time he healed or performed a miracle, but this time he spelled it out so plainly for those watching so they could fully grasp what is possible when we lift our eyes out of the natural and into the spiritual realm. When we surrender control of the anchored ways of man in order to see and operate in a realm that is higher and infinite. We don't just have a roadmap of his actions that we can follow in the scripture, but because of his sacrifice, his death, and his resurrection, he is now alive on the inside of us and desires nothing more than to operate through us to change the world around us. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning at verse 1 says, And you, He made alive when you were spiritually dead and separated from him because of your transgressions and sins in which you once walked. You were following the ways of this world influenced by the present age in accordance with the prince of power of the air, Satan, the spirit who is now at work in the disobedient, the unbelieving who fight against the purposes of God. Among these unbelievers, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, our behavior governed by the sinful self, indulging the desires of human nature, 
without the Holy Spirit and the impulses of the sinful mind. We were by nature children under the sentence of God's wrath, just like the rest of mankind. But God, being so very rich in mercy because of his great and wonderful love with which he loved us, even when we were spiritually dead and separated from him because of our sins, he made us spiritually alive together with Christ. For by his grace, his undeserved favor and mercy, you have been saved from God's judgment. And he raised us up together with him when we believed and seated us with him in heavenly places because we are in Christ Jesus. And he did this so that in the ages to come, he might clearly show the immeasurable and unsurpassed riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus by providing for our redemption. For it is by grace, God's remarkable compassion and favor drawing you to Christ that you have been saved, actually delivered from judgment and given eternal life through faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves, not through your own effort, but it is the undeserved gracious gift of God, not as a result of your works nor your attempts to keep the law, so that no one will be able to boast or take credit in any way for his salvation. For we are his workmanship, his own masterwork, a work of art, created in Christ Jesus, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, ready to be used for good works which God prepared for us beforehand, taking paths which he set so that we would walk in them living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us. The world today is full of so much chaos and turmoil, much of which finds a way to seep into our homes and does everything it can to anchor us in doubt, unbelief, shame, and fear. When we are awakened to the reality of Christ inside of us, when we realize it really is no longer us who lives, but Christ who lives in us, we will detach ourselves from the anchors that hold us down and allow ourselves to be raised with Christ into a realm where anything and everything is available and possible, where the things we might think are dead are really only sleeping. When my dad preached this message, uh, he would have everyone in the congregation take off their shoes and stand on their chairs to shift our natural eyes upwards as a means of shifting our spiritual eyes up into the realm that they can best see in. Uh, he would have people visualize what the Lazaruses in their lives were, and we would begin to call them back to life. It was such a powerful and beautiful thing to watch. I'm not going to stand on my couch right now, um, but I can't even tell you how often that I do. When I need to shake myself up and pull my vision higher, I'll stand on my chair or on our bed, anywhere that tricks my physical body into a state of surrender to spirit. It might sound really silly, but I promise you it works. If you are in a place of longing to access the riches that are in the glory if you need the help of divine to break the anchors from your spirit and to help elevate you to a place where you can not only see what Jesus sees, but operate in his power on the inside of you, then why don't we pray this prayer together? Divine creator, you sent your son Jesus to light the way to the glory. He is the light that leads us not only from the outside, but from the inside. Awaken us to the reality of the fullness of what Christ living and operating within us looks and feels like. Give us eyes to see the glory that is all around us. Give us the peace that comes with the knowledge that there is nothing impossible with you and there are no limits to your provision. Meet us in our frailties and grant us the understanding that the things we have been mourning as dead are really just asleep. Help us to lift up our eyes and to detach from the anchors of this world that do nothing but hold us captive. 
We want to see as you see and move between realms through the power of Christ inside us. It truly is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives through us, and we surrender to his authority, his power, and his grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I will leave you with a quote from Cahil Gibran. Love is the only freedom in the world because it so elevates the spirit that the laws of humanity and the phenomena of nature do not alter its course. I hope this musing has given you a little something to think about too.